Good afternoon. My name is uh, Gerald Allgaier. I am System Specialist for Vitrec, and I am joined today by my colleague Andrew Dawson, uh, Engineering Manager and Application Specialist. And today we will review our Gauge uh, Razor Edge and Razor Plus uh, PCIe Digitizer series. If there are any questions uh, during this presentation, uh, please submit your questions via the chat feature, and we will answer any questions during prompted question breaks and at the end of the presentation. First, let me provide a brief company introduction about Vitrec. We are a customer-oriented test and measurement industry leader. We are vertically integrated in that we both design and manufacture our state-of-the-art products completely in-house. Our products range from standard-based instruments to performance custom systems that we provide through our primary trusted product brands of Vitrec, MTI Instruments, and Gage. Vitrec was established in 1990 and has continued to expand in the test and measurement market with the acquisitions of MTI Instruments in 2022, originally established in 1961, and Gage in 2021, originally established in 1987. Vitrec is headquartered in Poway, California, near San Diego, with office locations in Lockport, Illinois, near Chicago, Albany, New York, and Lachine, Quebec, Canada. All products are made in the USA. We are an ISO 9001-2015 quality certified company and ISO 17025 accredited calibration lab certified company, and our products are Rojas compliant. Here we have our combined product lines. Together, we now offer test and measurement solutions in four key areas. Our Vitric brand specializes in high voltage electrical safety and compliance. Our MTI Instruments brand specializes in non-contact measurement solar and metrology systems and in turbine engine rotating measurement and balancing systems. Our Gauge brand specializes in high-speed data acquisition and signal recording systems. And when you receive a copy of this presentation, you can select any of these listed product line groups here to take you to our website to find out more about these product lines specifically. As you can see, our test and measurement product line is extensive. With our product lines, we serve a wide range of industries with applications that have demanding compliance and precision requirements from aerospace, energy, medical, semiconductor, and many more. When you receive a copy of this presentation, you can select any of the listed industry applications here, and that'll take you to our website to find out more about how our products are used in these areas. Our products are sold worldwide to a variety of commercial, educational, government, and defense organizations. Many of our customers are in the research and development field or in automated test equipment, ATE organizations that incorporate our products into their internal production testing lines or our original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, that incorporate our products into their own product solutions that they then resell to other organizations. Some of our clients include GE, Apple, Intel, Hewlett Packard, Siemens, Eaton, Philips Healthcare, Tesla, Cree, First Solar, XP Power, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, MIT, John Hopkins, Lawrence Livermore National Labs, Los Alamos National Labs, JPL, NASA, the US Air Force, Navy, Department of Defense, and many more. Age is known for our high-speed digitizers for the PC-based platform. The advantage of the open PC-based system platform is that it allows the capability to mix and match a variety of instruments tailored for a specific application requirement with very high speed data transfer rates via the PCI Express interface for real time signal based solutions. We offer PCI Express based digitizers with multiple channels of high A to D sampling rates with 8 bit, 12 bit, 14 bit, or 16 bit resolution, and with the capability to stream that acquired data in real time to the host CPU or GPU for signal processing and or high speed storage for signal recordings. Our digitizers are known for their high performance over a wide signal frequency range with quality signal conditioning and signal fidelity features. We provide powerful and easy to use PC oscilloscope, spectrum analyzer, and signal recording software options 
without the need for any programming, but also includes software development kits for C, C Sharp, Python, LabVIEW, and MATLAB, and no additional charge for our end user customer application development. Today, we are highlighting the Razor Edge and Razor Plus digitizer series. The Razor Edge that you see here in the left hand side table is our new entry point series with 14 bit and 16 bit resolution options featuring two channels with a maximum A to D sampling rate of 250 mega samples per second per channel. It has a total of 21 software selectable internal sampling rates that range from the minimum of one kilosample per second to the maximum 250 mega samples per second. The card features two sets of channel input pairs. There's a pair of input channels dedicated to 50 ohm input impedance connections with an input bandwidth from DC to 125 megahertz and a pair of input channels that are dedicated to one meg ohm input impedance connections with the input bandwidth from DC to 75 megahertz. All input channels are fixed for DC coupling with an option for fixed AC coupling or external AC coupling can also be implemented with the use of an SMA DC blocker item. There are six software selectable input ranges for plus minus 100 millivolts to plus minus 5 volts. It has a total of four giga samples, which is physically eight gigabytes of onboard memory and has a PCI Express Gen 3 by 8 interface that is fully capable of sustaining its maximum streaming rate of one gigabyte per second from the card. That's with two channels at the maximum 250 mega samples per second per channel with two bytes per sample for 14 bit or 16 bit data. The Razer Edge is competitively priced starting at $6,750 for the 14 bit model or $7,425 for the 16 bit model. The Razer Plus, which is at the right hand side table, is our middle series of 14 bit and 16 bit digitizers. And its features are basically very similar to the Razer Edge, but has a faster maximum A to D sampling rate of 500 mega samples per second per channel, thus offering a total of 30 software selectable sampling rates from one kilo samples to 500 mega samples and more input bandwidth of up to 250 megahertz with the 50 ohm input impedance connections or 150 megahertz with the one mega ohm input impedance connections. It features the same six software selectable input ranges, the same four giga samples or eight gigabytes of onboard memory, and the same PCI Express Gen 3 by 8 interface, fully capable of sustaining the faster maximum streaming rate of two gigabytes per second, with this model featuring two channels at the maximum 500 mega samples per second per channel. The Razer Plus is competitively priced starting at $8,175 for the 14 bit model or $8,850 for the 16-bit model. Both digitizer series do support external triggering with an external trigger input and output and support an external clock input for use with an external 10 megahertz reference clock source or to use as a direct sampling clock source in instances where an application wants to target a specific sampling rate that may not be available with the internal sampling rate selections. With that, I'm now going to be handing over the presentation to my colleague, Andrew Dawson, where he's going to be presenting some video presentations featuring the Razor Plus digitizer series in operation in a ultrasonic type application scenario. So Andrew, I'm going to hand over the presenter status to you. Sure. Right on. OK. Um, entire screen. Oops. Uh, okay, good afternoon. Um, uh, just a little background, although I did my doctorate on low temperature physics, I worked for several years uh, in ultrasonics, uh, research on ultrasonics. And indeed, although uh, the gauge card finds itself in a wide variety of applications because it's able to capture high speed signals of any nature, uh, uh, 
the, the gauge card can capture uh, signals from any different sorts of sort of probes. So it finds itself, as I say, in a wide variety of ap applications. Notwithstanding that fact, I would say uh, ultrasonics has always been uh, gauges bread and butter with between a quarter and a half of all gauge applications being one sort of uh, ultrasonics or another. Uh, uh, the two main, the main division, I would say, is between uh, material ultrasonics or non-destructive testing, a, a type of non-destructive testing, and medical ultrasonics, which is, uh, as the name implies, done on patients and so forth. We may have seen our, our children uh, on ultrasonic images inside the womb and so forth. So uh, most of the, I'll be presenting some measurements on uh, a gauge razor plus, and most of them will be within the context of uh, of ultrasonics measurements. So, uh, so I did a number of measurements here in our, our gauge lab with a bunch of instruments uh, and the, uh, really highlighting the gauge Razor Plus CompuScope 50214, which is a two channel 14 bit 500 mega sample per second digitizer. You can see it here installed in, in a PC. It's a half length card, so there's plenty of space there. And then if we look at the card from the back end, it's got um, uh, uh, SMA input connectors. You can see a signal connected up to channel one, and then there's the auxiliary connections at the bottom, trigger in and out, clock in and out, some of which we'll be discussing. Um, so as an overview of uh, an ultrasonic system, here's really a generic uh, ultrasonic system. So uh, the heart of it is this, um, this box with the X here. That's the uh, ultrasonic transducer, which when excited with a very short pulse, uh, that's high voltage, usually up to around uh, 300 volts and so forth. It emits uh, a ping of, of ultrasound here. We can see this pulse in water. This, uh, in this case, we're using uh, uh, water as a buffer medium between the ultrasonic transducer and the, um, uh, the slab of metal that serves as a sample. Uh, when, the, uh, wh when the transducer is excited, it emits a ping of ultrasonic, an ultrasonic pulse that travels towards the sample. At the same time, um, uh, out the back of the pulsar receiver, we have a, an output signal. I should say that we're operating this transducer in reflection mode. So it's responsible for both emitting the ultrasonic ping, but also receiving echoes coming back, much as you would uh, yell at a mountain, for example, hello, and listen for the uh, echoes coming back. And indeed, by counting the delay between the time you said hello and you heard the echoes back, knowing the speed of sound, you could actually work out how far that mountain was away. Out the back of the ultrasonic pulsar receiver, though, uh, they output a, a, a nice low voltage version of the ultrasonic signal, usually between zero and one volt, uh, sorry, plus or minus one volt. And then there's a trigger out, which creates, you can see here, a trigger pulse, a very sharp pulse that occurs um, uh, at the time of the ultrasonic excitation, which you can he see here on the signal, which saturates the input. We call it the big bang in the business. And uh, so the ultrasonic pulse and the, uh, the accompanying trigger pulse uh, serve as a sort of starter pistol, okay, uh, in the race of ultrasonic, uh, uh, ultrasonic race, if you will, all echoes come after uh, the, the ultrasonic, uh, the external trigger. Uh, and in this particular case, we typically aren't interested in pre-trigger data uh, because uh, all, the ultras, all, the, all the signals of interest occur after the excitation, but the gauge card is fully equipped to acquire pre-trigger data in that eventuality. Um, so uh, after emission of the ultrasonic pulse, it travels towards the sample over here, and you can see you get a reflection from the front wall of the sample that we see here in the ultrasonic signal, this big echo here. And, but not all the uh, ultrasound bounces off the front wall. Some of it enters into the sample, travels to the back wall, and then bounces off. So it makes a, um, a, a round trip through the sample, and we get this back wall echo here. In fact, the sound bounces back and forth, so you get echoes re reverberating uh, with an equal, equal delta T here uh, until they die out. So uh, the, the big measurement you often do in ultrasonics is this measurement of delta T between, um, uh, between the front and back wall echo. And knowing the, dis the extra distance that the back wall echo has traveled, which is twice the thickness because it went there and back, you can actually measure the ultrasonic velocity in this 
slab of metal. And if the metal were non-uniform in some way, parts of it might be stiffer and mushier. Uh, the speed of sound tends to depend on the stiffness of the material. So mushier areas would give a, a slower speed of sound and you'd be able to characterize the material that way. Alternately, you could look at the amplitude of the reflected echo. And that would give you an idea of the absorption of the ultrasound. So you might, um, uh, you know, in a particularly attenuating material, be able to characterize it by the attenuation. Uh, alternately, if if the material was uniform, of a you know like like a steel slab, uh, you could use the value of delta t to measure the thickness variation. So often this is done inside uh, big uh, reservoir containers that they store oil or water in. They're embedded in the ground. You can't get to the back uh, to the back wall of, because it's all buried. So what you do is you uh, introduce uh, ultrasound from the inside and listen to the echoes, see how thick the um, reservoir is and if there's been any corrosion that might lead to a leak eventually. Uh, they do similar things on submarines. Inside of a submarine is all covered with dials and, and uh, valves and so forth. So you can go over the outside of the submarine and listen for, crack, uh, for, uh, listen for echoes to see if there's any uh, weak spots, any thin areas in the submarine that we should look after. So, so that uh, so far, I've only talked about the front and back wall echo, but of course, any cracks which might occur uh, in between, in the middle of the um, uh, of the slab, would also reflect echoes, and those echoes could be arbitrarily small, depending on how small the the crack is. So, looking at this ultrasonic signal, we can see that the area between the front and back wall echo is clean of of any echo. So that tells us, to the extent that we can defect uh, detect these echoes, that there's no cracks in this material. So this, again, sort of gives you an overview of uh, ultrasonic NDT materials, ultrasound, and how you can measure thickness, material properties, and, um, uh, and crack presence with one non-destructive measurement. Um, so it's kind of nice because uh, interpreting it is, is relatively straightforward. You don't need any fancy Fourier transforms or anything like that. I should add that, that this system could be replaced quite easily with any number of other reflectometry type um, uh, applications. I could repl replace the ultrasonic uh, pulse receiver with a pulsed laser. And then I might have a LIDAR system where I bounce uh, laser pulses off of clouds or objects for surveying measure the delay to work out the position of those objects. Uh, this could be a radar dish uh, on an airplane where I'm emitting radar pulses, listening for echoes back from other planes. <clears throat> they even do things like, um, uh, they even do things like, um, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in fact, I had trouble with my cable and they, they brought a reflectometer box up doing the same thing, bounce, uh, bounce echoes and found out that there was a break in the cable because it reflected uh, reflected voltage waves. So as I say, although it's just uh, ultrasound, there's a lot of elements that are common to a lot of uh, other measurements. Uh, here's a picture of our uh, very old ultrasonic pulser receiver from Panametrics. I believe the company was bought by uh, Kramer about 20 years ago. Uh, it's it's really one of the lowest end models. And you'll see it's kind of broken in a way that we're actually going to use to illustrate some principles. Uh, here you can see we've got the uh, pulsar receiver set in reflection mode. Uh, I've chosen we've chosen to emit a low energy pulse. We've got over here on the left the PRF. So that's the pulse repeat frequency. So typically in ultrasonics you're sending uh, an excitation, listening to the echoes, but you're not just doing that once. You're doing that over and over and over again, uh, in between which you might be moving your ultrasonic transducer across a sample, uh, maybe in a two-dimensional grid, so that you can actually get uh, an image of the um, uh, of the material. So you could imagine uh, going over a um, going over a material the way you would mow a lawn uh, in order to get everything, and then and then color coding the positions of cracks in that in that in that slab let's say so that you could localize any uh, any cracks positionally if you see what i mean so um, yeah typically you're not just acquiring one waveform you're acquiring acquiring multiples and turning it into an image uh, here we've got the damping which controls how wide the pulse you excite with so you can change the shape of your ultrasonic uh, echoes that way um, and then we've got a gain here 
um, uh, which allows you basically a volume button to increase or decrease the amplitude of the echoes. Um, here's here's a, an ult the ultrasonic transducer I'm using. It's a contact ultrasonic transducer. The one in the uh, in the image I showed you was made to be immersed in water, uh, which you often do. But in this case, we'll be applying the ultrasonic transducer directly to the material under study. Which um, uh, so. Uh, first thing I'm going to show you is, is the advantage of sampling rate. So the two banner specifications of a digitizer are, are its sampling rate and its resolution. And the sampling rate is important in ultrasonics to the extent that it allows us to determine the position in time of ultrasonic echoes. So here I've shown uh, a typical ultrasonic echo. Yes, it's uh, mathematically generated, but it's, it's, uh, it could be a real ultrasonic echo, uh, sampled at a relatively low speed uh, on the bottom image. So what we've done here is uh, satisfied what we call Nyquist criteria, which many of you may have heard of, uh, which is a mathematical requirement that you must sample at at least twice a signal's maximum frequency in order to follow uh, that signal and not have its frequencies aliased or distorted to lower frequencies here. So we've respected the Nyquist criteria by sampling at, the, at, at least twice the, um, at exactly twice in fact, the central frequency of that ultrasonic echo. And you can see on the bottom image, we do get a, a rough idea of what the echo looks like, but it's a pretty crummy view of the signal. Once we move up to five or even 10 times sampling, now we're sampling at 10 times the central frequency of the ultrasonic echo, we can see that we get a really proper view of the, uh, of the echo. So really we recommend in the case of, of ultrasonics uh, that, that you sample at about 10 times the central frequency of the ultrasonic uh, transducer. You can see uh, that by sampling faster, really the, the, the sampling interval, the, the, the width between the samples, determines how accurately you can measure the position of that echo which is usually paramount in ultrasonic measurements. Uh, you can see in the bottom one, we're kind of lucky that the peak actually falls fairly close to that vertical dashed line, but it might have fallen as far away as a whole sample away. And then on the top, uh, on the top one, we get a, a much better view. So the, 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 the sampling rate, or more precisely, the sampling interval, uh, sets the scale of how accurately you can determine the position in time uh, of an of an ultrasonic echo. So sample, high sampling rate, the feature of sample high sampling rate translates directly into the benefit of good echo localization in time. Um, here I'm going to show you the, um, uh, so here what I've done is actually we're, we're looking at the signal, the ultrasonic signal itself in yellow on channel one and the trigger signal, the trigger pulse on channel two. Normally I would uh, connect that to the external trigger input, but since we, whoops, since we weren't using the, um, the channel two anyway, I figured for illustration purposes, and you can see we're triggering on that, um, that um, uh, external trigger pulse, and the ultrasonic echo always comes uh, quite uh, quickly afterwards. What we notice right away is that things are jittering around and the amplitude of the external trigger pulse is uh, is jumping up and down. That's no failing of the gauge card. That's actually a broken pulsar receiver. And what I did actually was, so here we're, we're, we're looking at the full sampling rate of 500 mega samples per second. We're only looking at about two or three microseconds worth of signal. Uh, so what I've done in order to understand this noise is to decrease the sampling rate and increase the number of points uh, up from 8192 to 8 million. And by doing that, we've increased the acquisition time from a few uh, microseconds to several hundred, uh, to 100, I guess, or so uh, uh, milliseconds. So that's a time scale de-zooming factor of what, 10,000. And by doing that, uh, what I've done here is uh, put the cursors exactly uh, 100 milliseconds apart, and then I've counted uh, this variation in the amplitude of the external trigger pulse. And you can see there's exactly 12 uh, cycles of this variation, 12 divided by 100 milliseconds works out to be at 120 hertz, which is exactly twice the 60 hertz line frequency. So that tells us that somehow our ultrasonic uh, pulse receiver is picking up uh, uh, twice the line frequency. Uh, so almost that diagnoses what needs to be done to repair it, which of course we won't do. Um, 
So now I've shown you what the raw uh, ultrasonic big bang signal looks like when we don't have the transducer connected to anything. Here what I've done is connected it to a slab of aluminum, I think that is. And uh, we put a little, uh, little lip balm, really, any kind of grease, basically, to couple the, um, uh, couple, couple the transducer uh, to the metal. And uh, so that's the signals we're going to look at. Now, unfortunately, I haven't shown both the Big Bang Echo and the back wall echo, but that's the back wall echo. You can see it's much smaller. It's not saturating uh, the input the other way it is. So that's the echo. It's jumping around because of that 60 hertz um, noise we told you about. And that's the first thing we're going to get rid of. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is in this next one is zoom in on this echo horizontally. So I'll stop here. Whoops, stop. And let's see, we're looking, uh, so the output of the um, ultrasonic pulser receiver uh, is a plus and minus one volt output. So we have uh, matched that to the uh, uh, Razor Plus's plus and minus one volt input range. And uh, the, we've got gauge scope, I'm sorry, this is gauge scope, our flagship oscilloscope software that operates all of our um, all of our gauge cards and allows you to operate the card without writing a line of computer code. Ultimately, most of our customers do end up uh, programming the card uh, themselves and integrating it into their own custom measurement system. But gauge scope uh, is a great platform to demonstrate the card and also get familiar with it and any troubleshooting necessary. So here we show um, that the, the vertical scale is one volt. So you can see the full scale input is plus or minus one division on this scale. What I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna start the video again, and we're gonna zoom in on uh, vertically by a factor of 100. To demonstrate, you see, if this were, an, this is a 14-bit digitizer, if this were an 8-bit digitizer, then that would mean that there's two to the eight, which is 256, 256 digitizer levels spread across this plus or minus one volt range. I should note that the vast majority, virtually all, not all, all, but almost all oscilloscopes, standalone box oscilloscopes are eight bit devices. So most of them will have, as I say, 256 levels distributed across the input range. So what I'm gonna do now is zoom in, whoops, zoom in by a factor of 100. You see over here, we're gonna go from one volt vertical scale we're gonna go, cursor's going around there, one, two, three, one, two, three. Now we're down to 10 millivolts per division, which is one hundredth of, uh, one hundredth of what we were looking at before. That is, uh, instead of a one division, plus or minus one division being full scale, plus or minus one division is now only 1% of full scale. And, uh, and so each, each half of the, um, of the range has half of the 256 levels across it, uh, 128 levels. If you ignore the difference between 100 and 128, it turns out then these le this this division height here is equal to one level on an 8-bit digitizer. So what that means is that if we were using an 8-bit digitizer, all of these subtle echoes here, could, the staircase would be one division high. So so this uh, one, le uh, one level high. So this echo, for example, which is about two divisions high, would just show as one uh, would 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 uh, would show as two staircases, if you see what I mean. And little subtle wiggles like this, which are below a division, would be lost completely if you were looking at an eight-bit digitizer. Because, however, this is a fourteen-bit digitizer, uh, and the difference between eight and fourteen is six. Two to the six is six, uh, 64. That means uh, you have 64 times more levels, okay? So for every division uh, with our 14-bit digitizer here, we don't have just one level, but 64. And that allows us to follow these very subtle wiggles in the signal. So ultrasonic people generally do not have to be sold on the value of high resolution, you see, because, because the high resolution uh, feature translates directly into the benefit of small echo detectability thresholds. And because as we said before, that a flaw echo, flaws could be arbitrarily small and the echoes can there from them can be arbitrarily small, flaw echoes can be arbitrarily small. So this, the, the, the more resolution you have, the, the lower your minimum echo detectability threshold. So that's a real 
direct translation from a feature to a benefit. So now we've gone over the two ban uh, the, the, the benefits of the two banner features of a digitizer, high sampling rate and high resolution, and shown how both of them are huge advantages in ultrasonics. Uh, here's the same uh, the same illustration done more on the blackboard. Here what we've done is calculated the 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 minimum back wall the sorry the best case back wall echo you could get for a slab of steel in water. Okay, here's the front wall echo, and because it's so big, you you can't increase the gain. You remember I had that knob on my ultrasonic pulse receiver. I can increase the gain of the amplifier, but I can't increase the gain any more than already is here because I would saturate this front wall echo. So I'm I'm forced by the front wall echo to keep the gain uh, at a certain amount. And that limits then, as I say, by the, the physics of the situation, the size of this back wall echo, which turns out to be only about two levels for an 8-bit digitizer. So, so this is the very best case of what you can get off a back wall echo uh, in, in, of steel and water. I haven't accounted for attenuation in the steel or divergence of the beam, right? The beam spreads out. That also lowers the echo. So any, any other effect that I've left out that you can name will conspire to reduce this echo even further than it already is. It's already pretty darn small, but it'll be smaller still in real life. And then if we go to flaw echoes that can occur between these two echoes, those, again, can be arbitrarily small. So for steel and water, the very best case for an 8-bit digitizer is two levels, which stinks, I'm arguing. If we now look at, at uh, a 14-bit digitizer, where we have, again, two to six, 64 times more levels, we can really get a view, good view of this echo. So that, again, illustrates the power of high resolution in ultrasonics. Um, now what? Okay, uh, now we're going to look at scanning. Uh, is that right? Sorry. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to use the effect of this, um, of this jitter from the 60 hertz here. So we've got the echo. There it is jumping all around. In gauge scope, I'm able to do signal averaging. That's where we take multiple waveforms, sum them all together, and divide by the number of waveforms in order to signal average. So the blue result there is the result of averaging together, I think it was 400 uh, uh, acquisitions from the, of the single acquisitions of the yellow waveform. So you can see, and I'll run it again here, you can see that by doing 400 averages, we, we average away the jitter and the amplitude variations associated with the uh, 60 hertz pickup to where it's completely gone. So this illustrates the power of signal averaging in ultrasonics. The downside is I can't move as fast because I can, I, I'm not just taking one waveform per, um, uh, per, per, uh, per position, let's say. I have to take 400. That sort of illustrates a general principle that the longer I measure, the better measurement I get. This sort of translates into, you know, the higher sampling speed you want, the less maximum resolution is available typically. Uh, so uh, again, we'll go to the Blackboard case the, uh, uh, of signal averaging. Here's, again, a, a simulated ultrasonic echo with various levels of random noise, not 60 cycle pickup. You can see uh, at the bottom, just a one-shot acquisition of the uh, ultrasonic uh, echo. And there we can see we've got a, a signal-to-noise ratio of about one. The echo is not much bigger than the noise level. But as we average uh, successive waveforms, sum them together, um, uh, we can reduce the noise because the noise tends to average to zero, whereas the ultrasonic echo is the same, same shape for every acquisition. And so it constructively interferes. And indeed, if we do 100 averages here, we can almost average the noise away completely. In fact, you can show that the, that the uh, residual noise will decrease as the square root of the number of averages. And here we've taken 100 averages, so we've reduced the noise by a factor of root 100 or 10 uh, in that top image. Now, uh, uh, as I say, uh, Gage Scope does averaging in software, okay? So what it'll do to get 100 averages, it'll download 100 waveforms, sum them all together in software, and uh, present the result. But what the gauge card is able to do, actually, with a special expert firmware option for signal averaging, is to actually sum the waveforms up on the card itself, okay, and thereby alleviate, well, it does two things. It alleviates the task of doing the averaging from the host computer, but more importantly, it dramatically reduces the data, uh, the data volume. 
basically you send the card 100 averages instead of getting 100 waveforms you only get one waveform so now you only have to download one waveform instead of 100 and that can allow uh, ultrasonic acquisition to go correspondingly faster so by doing the averaging on board we get two advantages we free up the, the pc from doing the calculations we also reduce the data volume thereby increasing the overall throughput so that's a very powerful feature of gauge cards all of them really not just the razor uh, the razor plus and razor edge uh, but all of them are equipped with onboard signal averaging now we're going to move to something a little more subtle okay and this is our trigger out feature okay the, all of all gauge cards are equipped with a trigger out functionality um, which as the name suggests uh, spits out a pulse which you can see here in green uh, every time the card triggers so you see we're now using a sine wave not an ultrasonic a signal to trigger the card at the zero crossing here the trigger point is this vert vertical dashed line and um, I'll run it again here and a couple of microseconds later, the card spits out this sharp pulse suitable for triggering. Now, the two, I'll start with the secondary advantages of this, which are um, that basically normally, or the, the sort of conventional way to do ultrasonics is to have the, the pulse receiver alt, uh, externally trigger uh, the gauge card. In this case, uh, if we reverse the arrow of triggering and have the gauge card trigger the ultrasonic pulse or receiver, if in fact it is externally triggerable, which my, which my uh, low end pulse or receiver was not, it is not able to be externally triggered. So it can't profit from this feature, but many of them can, most of them can. Um, so, uh, so by reversing the trigger arrow, instead of sitting around waiting for the next trigger, when it comes the card can actually generate the trigger itself as soon as it's ready so that's kind of advantage number one uh, the second advantage uh, is that although you can set up the, the card to um, to uh, process the triggers quickly enough that it shouldn't miss any trigger i won't say you're never never quite sure because you can be but here because you're generating the triggers yourself you're actually triggering the card from software which makes it spit out the trigger out pulse, which triggers your ultrasonic pulse receiver. Uh, there's no possibility of missing triggers because you don't generate them until you're ready for them. So these, again, I say are, are secondary benefits of the trigger out um, uh, uh, functionality. The main advantage, however, in order to consider that, we, we, we have to understand the way the gauge card triggers. Some people think that when the external trigger arrives at the gauge card, it starts digitizing. That's not true. You actually start the card uh, digitizing pre-trigger data, and it sits there waiting for the trigger. And when the trigger occurs, it sort of books, bookmarks that point as the trigger point, okay? And here's the key somewhat subtle point, okay? If those triggers are asynchronous or unrelated to our 500 mega sample per second, 500 megahertz sampling clock in this case, and why would they be? Why would, why would they be related in any way? They aren't, of course. The, the boxes aren't connected anyway, so there's no reason. Uh, since, the, since the triggers are asynchronous to the sampling clock, on successive acquisitions, they're going to arrive with different phases with respect to this trigger point. So here I've drawn five different black triggers, okay, that occur at, at diff on different acquisitions, but those would all be logged as this trigger point because that's the next sample point, that's the next clock edge after the trigger occurs. So basically the card can't tell the difference between these five external triggers. When you then plot them on top of each other, the signal will appear to dance left and right by exactly one sample. We've had customers call up and say, what's the problem? The signal's dancing left and right by a sample. No, no, sir, this is no failing of the gauge card. This is a fundamental consequence of the asynchronicity between the clock and trigger. So how do you beat that asynchronicity? Well, by, by using our trigger out output, which is synchronous. It's illustrated in red here. It always occurs its phase is always the same. It may not be exactly lined up with the trigger point. In fact, we know it comes out several samples later, uh, several dozen samples later, but the point is it's, it's, it's rock steady uh, as compared to the phase of the sampling. So it doesn't have this one point jitter. 
And if we can trigger our ultrasonic pulse receiver box with this trigger, we can the, the, the ultrasonic signal will inherit the synchronicity of, uh, of the trigger out and thereby also not have this one point jitter. So we're going to illustrate this actually uh, with a sine wave. We've, oh, the same sine wave we had in the first. So here we had the sine wave, and then um, a couple micro, a few microseconds later, the trigger out pulse comes in. So if I zoom in on the sine wave, which I've done here into the zero crossing, we can see it jitter back and forth. And if we use gauge scope's uh, persistence uh, function, which we're going to do in a sec here, which suppresses erasure, erasure doesn't allow erasing of the waveform between acquisitions, they build up, as you can see here. Uh, so it's going back and forth here and, and, and sweeping out this ribbon over time. And these two cursors here, I've separated by exactly two nanoseconds, which is, uh, right, uh, two nanoseconds, yes, which is the sampling interval, okay? So the inverse of 500 mega samples per second, inverse of 500 megahertz or 500 mega samples per second is two nanoseconds per sample, okay, every two nanoseconds we take a, a sample, and indeed it's two nanoseconds, the, the division width is 10, so this, this spacing is two nanoseconds, is exactly as we predicted on the previous slide, the width of that ribbon. So here we are showing the unbeatable uh, one sample jitter that occurs uh, for an asynchronous signal, because of course the sine wave uh, from my generator knows absolutely nothing about the sampling clock from, uh, from the gauge card. But if we shift to the right now, okay, over to the trigger out pulse, we can see there's a falling edge of the sine wave still jittering by one sample in yellow there, but the green trigger out pulse, I'm sorry, what I've done here is taken the trigger out pulse and looped it back into channel two, which normally you wouldn't do. Normally you'd trigger out something else out, but I'm just trying to show the stability of it. So now we turn on the persistence again and we get a width so now I've gone down to two nanoseconds per division. And you can indeed see from the, from the cragginess, right? You can see here that, that a sample is the difference between these two sharp corners here, right? That's, that's where the, the, the lines are connected. So, so those are the points. So that proves basically that the, uh, a sample is, is a division wide. But you can see that the width of the ribbon is way less than a sample. I'd say it's something like 1 20th of, uh, of a sample. So, so we can see that the jitter, because of its synchronicity, the jitter on the trigger out pulse is not one sample, but something like a 20th of a sample, 20 times better. How often do you get a 20 times uh, improvement factor in this life? Not often, I'll tell you that much. Uh, uh, what was I gonna say? That, um, that yes, this jitter is limited only by the electrical jitter of the components themselves on the card. Okay, which is kind of unbeatable, but there's none of this one sample kind of jitter that otherwise occurs because of asynchronous. So again, what we would do is connect this um, trigger out pulse to an externally triggerable pulse or receiver. It would inherit the synchronicity and the, the lack of jitter of the trigger out pulse, and you would, uh, you would have 20 times less jitter on your ultrasonic signal. And since, of course, you're trying to get the position of echoes, that correspondingly improves your echo localizability and uh, therefore the quality of your ultrasonic measurements. So I, uh, I sort of lied before I suggested that, uh, that it was a slab of aluminum I had. In fact, the aluminum slab has these very um, special holes drilled in them. I was looking at a part where there were no holes before, but here we're going to look at, we're going to in fact scan over uh, these holes, but on the other side. So you could, uh, so we've got a shallow hole, a, um, a medium hole, and a deep hole here. And you could imagine these were on the other side, the buried side of your reservoir, so you couldn't see them. We're going to go over, uh, go over. There's another view of the holes. We're going to sweep. We're going to scrub. I think they call it over. So these holes are are uh, are underneath the uh, the slab now. Uh, uh, in this direction I'm showing with my cursor, we're going to scan across this, scrub across this, and look at the position of the three echoes in gauge scope. So that's what we're doing here. So the transducer is not connected. We're going to put it down on the, on the slab. There's the back wall echo with no holes. We move on. There's the shallow hole, you see? So there's almost as much metal. There's the medium hole. 
right? And then the very deep hole has very little metal to go through, so it bounces back right away, you see? So, so as I say, when the hole is, is shallow, then, then most of the metal is still there, and you hit, it's almost, a, it's almost a map, right? You can turn this from, from time into distance, and indeed some ultrasonic systems will be calibrated in distance measurements right here. That told us that the, uh, that the first hole was shallow with an end here, and then with a, with a deeper end on the medium hole, and a very deep end on the, on the deep hole, if you see what I mean. So we, we did that manually. I scanned back and forth running gauge scope, but of course I didn't by any means capture all triggers because in between each acquisition, gauge scope had to connect all these line segments. That probably took several milliseconds. And I can tell you the, um, there are several triggers coming per millisecond. So we missed you know, dozens and dozens of triggers um, um, as uh, in between each acquisition and display under gauge scope, which typically you don't want to do. You want to be able to scan as quickly as you can. So we're going to illustrate now uh, the multiple record feature of gauge scope. So uh, this gauge card I'm looking at has um, uh, the gauge card I'm looking at uh, has um, uh, uh, four giga samples of onboard memory. Now we can use that continuously. We could trigger the card once and fill up the card's memory. Uh, the card's capturing at 500 mega samples per second. If we were on one channel, uh, there's two bytes per sample. So it's actually, ca uh, sorry, sorry, I won't do that uh, conversion. I'll just say it's capturing 500 mega samples per second. That's half a giga sample per second. So every giga sample would correspond to two seconds. We've got four giga samples of memory, so we could capture continuously for eight seconds. However, um, uh, our ultrasonic signal is only active for a few microseconds every millisecond or so. So sort of 99.9% .9 of the time, it's, um, it's boring, it's a flat line, it's zero. And we don't wanna waste our onboard memory by filling it up with 99.9% .9 of the time with, with flat lines. So what gauge scope allows you to do is trigger the card acquire a few microseconds worth, and then rearm the card lightning fast in hardware within a microsecond, and then wait for the next trigger to occur, thereby uh, not filling the memory with all kinds of uninteresting data. Uh, so, so now, if we were only to capture 0.1%, one in a 1,000, uh, because we're capturing a few micros, uh, a few microseconds worth of data uh, every millisecond or so, it's more like 99% of the time we're not acquiring. So our eight seconds worth of acquisition would be multiplied by a hundredfold, and we'd be able to acquire uh, these triggers, not continuously in a segmented fashion, using our multiple record mode for uh, something like 80 seconds. Well, I'm not gonna do that. I just wanted to give you an idea of the power of this. So we're gonna illustrate it uh, so what we did was we did an acquisition. Uh, okay, I set up the, the pulse receiver to create triggers at about 350 times uh, per second, okay? And then I scraped across the, uh, the three holes on the non-hole side with the ultrasonic transducer over about three or four seconds worth. And I acquired all those triggers in our multiple record mode. And now I'm going to look at them in gauge scope. So I'll to open them, you'll see the colors are significantly more brilliant than they were in the screen capture I did. Um, assuming that's translated through the Teams or the uh, the um, whatever this telecon is called. So I'm going to turn off my live signals here, and I'm going to say file load channel, uh, quick access. Uh, this one uh, okay this one and then up up uh, uh, it's under this one right training this uh, no no training webinar uh, webinar uh, Razor Plus Edge. Here we go. So here's my uh, here's my multiple record file I acquired. Uh, open. So um, 
So you see, as I said, I acquired a thousand waveforms over uh, with a trigger rate of something like 350 uh, hertz, 350 triggers per second. So as a result, I acquired for about three seconds. I scrubbed the, uh, uh, the transducer across those three holes in three seconds. So um, let me zoom in horizontally and vertically. And the first thing I want to show you is to prove to you that I'm really acquiring at that fast trigger rate. You recall that uh, we proved that the oscillations on the signal that resulted from the 60 hertz or 120 uh, hertz pickup were oscillating at 120 and since 120 hertz. And since we're acquiring 350 uh, triggers per second, 350 hertz triggers, uh, it, we should be acquiring about three, three of those, uh, sorry, there should be about three acquisitions per 120 hertz cycle. So if I flip through these waveforms, one by one, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You can see three, one, two, three. You can see, as I predicted, uh, the cycle of the waveform. We're actually seeing the, uh, the 120 hertz oscillate thing because we're acquiring so quickly at 300. Well, actually, it's not as quickly as the gauge card can go, but it's pretty darn quick at 350 uh, uh, waveforms per second. We can actually see that oscillation. Uh, so that kind of proves where we're uh, acquiring them as fast as I thought I did. Now I will pr press play, okay? So we have these, what I call the VCR buttons. Uh, for those of you who remember those archaic devices, I'll press play and we ought to be able to see the same thing as we did before really, but now we're, now we're capturing every single waveform at 300 waveforms per second. Um, as I say, because, because the card's able to rearm itself in hardware after each acquisition, uh, we can go at rates, the card can really go at rates of 10, you know, 100 times faster, 10, 30, even 100,000 uh, triggers per second. So there's the shallow hole. You see, we, we still see a bit of the back wall echo because the hole is smaller than the transducer. So you're still getting some reflections from the back wall of the, uh, of the slab, not from the hole. So there we're, we're, we're passing over the first hole. Now we're in between the two holes. So we only see the back wall echo. Then we'll see the medium hole. And that echo arrives sooner because there's less meat, less metal in between uh, the wall and the hole. Um, and we pass over it. See, it, it, it increases, it starts to decrease again. Of course, we have to ignore the oscillations. And then how we doing? Okay, we're we're seventy percent of the way through. That was the trick. And not I could have gone faster, but then we'd be here all afternoon. Or wanted to fit within within the uh, seminar time. So then we'll see the final echo, the shallow hole. We even get, as you can see, two reverberations there. We've got a second hole, uh, a second echo. That's that's the sound bouncing off the hole, bouncing back off the front wall, and then off the off the hole again a second time. And as you see, we always get the back wall echo a bit because the hole is, is uh, the area of the hole is smaller than the area of the transducer. So that's an illustration of our very powerful multiple record mode, which still operates in uh, what we call memory mode. Uh, so for, for our final illustration here, we're going to show streaming, okay? So for streaming, I'm going to um, I'm going to use a sine wave signal uh, from this generator, simple generator. Uh, I'm not an ultrasonic transducer. And what I'm going to do during the acquisition is play with the amplitude knob. So we'll show you the ac the acquisition, but uh, I I guess the acquisition takes how long? 20 seconds. 20 seconds. So what I did was I reduced the amplitude slowly counting one, a thousand, two, a thousand, so then increased it slowly, then left it, and then quickly decrease, increase at the end, okay? So you'll see that in our acquisition. So here, here's the actual, actual acquisition going on. So, um, so a gauge scope supports our memory mode acquisition, which has the disadvantage that it's limited to the card's onboard memory, which is pretty darn big, but it's still finite. Uh, uh, so it's it's limited to acquisitions of that size. After you fill up the card's onboard memory, you have to stop and download it. Um, uh, 
but it's a simpler mode to operate in and operates under gauge scope. In streaming, um, you actually, uh, sorry, so again, memory mode is where you capture the data into the card's onboard memory, stop and download the data, during which time you're blind, and then you can repeat that process. So you're always missing data in the memory mode. In streaming mode, however, you actually fill the card's onboard memory, but empty it as the acquisition is going on. The memory is configured as dual port, meaning it can be written to and read from at the same time. So by doing that, assuming that, that the, 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 the memory is not being filled too quickly and that it's being emptied quickly enough, uh, and this is where the consumer of the data has to hold up his end of the deal. He has to consume the data quickly enough that, that all the data are consumed, that there's no overflow, which occurs if uh, the consumer doesn't consume quick enough, okay? So what is the consumer? Well, often the consumer is uh, our SSD drive, solid state drives. Uh, you can get uh, many, many terabytes of solid, fast solid state drives these days. So we, uh, we've configured, and Gerald's the expert in that domain, configured um, recording systems that are able to record for many hours and even days with, as I say, uh, in some cases, hundreds, I guess we can put up to 200 terabytes of, uh, of uh, solid, uh, solid, store, uh, solid state storage drive in the computer. However, the, um, uh, the, 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 we have to confirm, we have to construct the disk system such that it's able to take the speed of the acquisition. Uh, another popular target is uh, a GPU card where you can stream data to the GPU card and have the uh, GPU card perform operations processing the data and hopefully also reducing it. Okay, so that's another popular target. Here what we're going to use is PC RAM. Now the disadvantage of PC RAM is it's relatively limited. You can get up to something like a terabyte of, uh, of PC RAM, maybe more these days. Uh, but the advantage of PC RAM is it's real fast. So we don't have to worry about PC RAM holding up its end of the deal and being able to consume the data stream quickly enough so that there's no loss of data. So to do this, we've enlisted our uh, C sample program, Gauge Stream to RAM. As you can see here, let me zoom in on this somewhat. Uh, it's a console application, meaning it doesn't have a GUI associated with it. Uh, all our sample programs are structured this way to keep them as absolutely simple as possible so that the customer who's, um, who's uh, going to build upon uh, the sample program doesn't have to disentangle the GUI elements from the acquisition elements. So uh, virtually all of our sample programs simply do one acquisition, store the results to file, and that's it. Okay, so we run the sample program. And this almost becomes like the, by, by streaming into RAM, it's almost like you're, you're replacing the card's onboard memory with PC RAM. So, so, uh, so you can really, you know, conceptually it's very similar. You see what I mean? So uh, first thing the, uh, the sample program does is report back the board name, uh, selects the expert streaming image, which is a separate functionality that has to be added to the card. And it set up a buffer, okay, a, a buffer in the PC RAM of, uh, this works, this is 20 billion bytes, 20 gigabytes, because there's two bytes per sample, that corresponds to 10 giga samples. Because we're acquiring at 500 mega samples per second, every two seconds we acquire a giga sample of data. So since we're going to acquire 10 giga samples, 10 times 2 is 20, we're going to acquire uh, 20 seconds worth of continuous data. Now, you may recall before I said if we filled up the card's onboard memory of 4 giga samples, that would take uh, 8 seconds. So we've increased the, the memory capacity of, of the card by 2.5, going from 4 to 20 giga samples, sorry, 4 to 10 giga samples, or from 8 to 20 seconds of acquisition, okay? Now this computer only had, as I say something, I think it had 32 gigabytes of, uh, of RAM in it, which is fairly small. I was able to usurp or, or appropriate 20 gigabytes worth. Uh, as I say, you could put up to um, uh, a terabyte or more, thereby 50 tupling the, uh, the amount of um, memory in the computer. 
uh, and bring it from, uh, or the amount of memory you can use for the acquisition, thereby going from eight to eight times 50, what would that be? Uh, 400 seconds, okay? So we could capture up to four, uh, 400 seconds just with PC RAM. So the, the RAM buffer is allocated, initialize, initializing the RAM buffer, and then we start the streaming acquisition. So uh, this, the, unfortunately, I couldn't record this with my screen recording software. This amount here increases as the acquisition uh, goes on. So here's the final amount, which is 20 gigabytes of data acquired. Here's the rate, okay? Now the rate from the, from the card is 500 mega samples per second on one channel times two bytes per sample is uh, one gigabyte per second, okay? So here we're not, uh, that would be a thousand megabytes per second, but there's kind of an overhead time at the beginning. So as you watch this um, rate, it starts out low and gradually increases sort of asymptotically to the real value of 1000. But we know we haven't missed any data during the acquisition because we didn't see any FIFO overflows, okay? So the FIFO being the onboard uh, CompuScope memory through which the data are streaming. So we're streaming the data onto the PCI bus and into PC RAM, but through the card's onboard memory. So if the, if the PC RAM were, were for some reason, which it never does, to get locked up and not for a little while, or if the PCI bus was to get locked up, which can happen, but not for very long, uh, the, the card's onboard memory would, would, would uh, sort of accept for that overflow, just as if you plugged a, uh, plugged a plug in the sink and kept, kept the, the water flowing, it wouldn't overflow until the sink got filled up. Similarly, until the onboard memory got filled up, you wouldn't, you wouldn't um, uh, uh, miss any data. And if the plug got pulled in the sink, and I'm jumping from one analogy to the next, uh, as long as you pulled the, the plug quickly enough, uh, you know, the, 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 the water that was filled up in the sink would drain off. Similarly, if the, you know, as soon as the PCI bus became unlocked, uh, it would empty out that FIFO as long as it wasn't blocked for too long. So that analogy works quite well. So as I say, because we didn't see any FIFO overflows, we know we haven't missed any data. And indeed, we've also uh, examined the data to make sure there's no you know, breaks in the sine waves we acquire. Uh, here we can see the elapsed time was 22 uh, seconds. The actual acquisition was only 20 seconds, but there was a kind of a two second setup time. It tells us the stream was successfully finished in one segment. Um, and again, no FIFO overflows. And then we, uh, the total data again, 10 gigabytes. And then we save to disk, which actually takes uh, significantly longer than 20 seconds because the disk wasn't, it's, it's nothing special disk basically. And so isn't, isn't able to take that rate of one gigabyte per second. I should add that, uh, that our gauge cards can go at, at up to five times faster than one gigabyte per second, uh, up to five gigabytes per second. These particular cards uh, we're, we're talking about uh, can't generate more data than that. So, so basically uh, for the Razer Plus and the Razer's Edge card, the, you know, the, there's no rate, rate at which you can't stream. So now that we've acquired this, uh, this data, it's in this file called amp twiddle because I twiddled, twiddled the amplitude, as I said, increased it slowly, decreased it, and then, or no, other way, decrease, increase, and then quick decrease, increase. And again, we've got our 20 gig, exactly 20 gigabytes uh, file with 128 uh, uh, byte padding probably required for uh, file size uh, rectification or whatever. So what we're going to do now is open up this file in our gauge viewer here. So here, our gauge viewer. So uh, there's the sine wave. We're going to scan through. So each gigabyte you'll see is two seconds. So here you can see it started to decrease its amplitude coming up on two, sec two seconds, one gig, four seconds now. We're getting to the lowest point there. Six seconds, almost no signal. Then I start increasing the amplitude again, eight seconds, four giga, four giga samples, 10 seconds, 12, 14, eight, 16, and then quick, quick reduction increase. So, um, so here you can see we've acquired at a very high rate of 500 mega samples per second, looking at a pretty fast sine wave, but we're able to fat, uh, to track it over human type time scales, in this case, 
uh, 20 seconds. So that's an illustration of our streaming functionality available on all our CompuScope cards with uh, sample programs uh, illustrating operation different streaming modes. So with that, I will pass the talking stick back to Gerald and stop sharing, right? Uh, All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, while we have highlighted the uh, Razer Edge and Razer Plus, Gage does have more digitizer models to choose from. And here is a table matrix of our current digitizer product models. Uh, you can see this when you get the copy of the presentation, but it kind of goes through the various specs of the different models, their starting at pricing and so forth. And as we previously uh, indicated before, all of our digitizers come with the Gatescope Light Edition software and our complete library of SDKs at no additional charge. As you mentioned, we do have the capability of adding digital signal processing, whether it be with the onboard FPGA on the digitizers or streaming to GPU CUDA cards. Um, as he mentioned, we can use expert streaming to stream uh, to a GPU target card or to the host CPU for processing analysis or to high-speed storage for single recording operations. Or we can use uh, various expert FFT features depending on the digitizer model. All of our digitizers are strongly supported with our software. <clears throat> In addition to the gauge scope and SDKs we mentioned, we also have an uh, IF signal recording app called DSCope, uh, which basically adds the additional capability of conducting high-speed signal recordings uh, to your system with the ability to view that uh, data snapshots in real time as the data is being recorded on multiple analysis displays. Uh, similarly, we have an RF signal recording based application called Spectroscope RT, which is very similar to DSCope. It just adds the additional RF front end support uh, for uh, RF receivers that will down convert a high frequency signal down to a lower IF range that our digitizers can accept to then do the real time signal recordings to storage. We also offer optional six stations for complete turnkey systems. These are high performance PC workstations uh, that are designed for integrating our gauge cards and really for maximizing their operational performance. For real time operations, it's typically critical that the underlying host platform is capable of sustaining high speed PCI Express data streaming rates, especially to and from multiple instruments that are operating together simultaneously. So the six stations come with all the gauge cards, features and software fully tested and installed so that the user can be up and running with the, their system solution right out of the box and thus saving time and minimizing risks of self-integrated systems. Our custom configurations can be portable, laptop, uh, desktop, 1U, 2U, and 4U rack mounts, and we can have storage capacities of high speed up to all the way up to 368 terabytes uh, currently today. So at this point, we're now open uh, for any uh, questions that anyone may have. We can provide tailored custom hardware and software solutions to meet specific application requirements. You can review our products in more detail on the web at vitrick.com slash gauge or email us at sales-gauge at vitrick.com or call us toll free at 800-567-GAGE or for outside North America, 815-838-0005. Thank you very much for your time today. We hope you enjoyed this presentation.